May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I want to talk about monkeys for a minute. Somehow, Sort of seems strange to be doing that on the second Sunday of Easter, but there is this, this story of monkeys, particularly in India, that, that for years has always fascinated me and has always taught me something about uh, my own behavior. In India, and you may have heard this story before, hunters do have a way of catching monkeys. They take a coconut and they cut it in half, and then they hollow it out. They put a hole in the side of it, and the hole is just big enough for a monkey's hand to pass through. And so then they take this half a coconut, and they put it on the ground, and underneath it, they put something like fruit or something that the monkey would be very interested in eating. And then they, they secure this half coconut shell there so that uh, it won't get knocked over. So curiosity and an investigative nose tells the monkey that there is something in there, something that they want. And so they put their hand into the hole, and they grab onto what they want, and then they pull their hand, and it's stuck. It's stuck because their hand is closed around that which they desire or think is going to give them great joy. And they're stuck there when hunters come along and get the monkey. To quote a contemporary theologian on this, by the name of Mick Jagger, <laughs> you can't always get what you want. This morning's gospel reading begins in a room, in a location somewhere in Jerusalem. And lest you think, because this is the second Sunday of Easter, that it was filled with gently glowing candles and the sweet smell of incense in the air, we must instead picture a darkened room with only minimal light and a crowd of Jesus' disciples gathered. Not all of them, though. Two of them are missing. Thomas, the twin, and the other disciple, Judas Iscariot. It is not a pleasant and warm gathering this Sunday evening after two days after Jesus died. The room is filled with anxiety, knotted stomachs, dry mouths and sweaty palms, frightened, startled by what has happened over the past few days and scared stiff about the unknown, but definitely dismal prospects of what is to come. Another great theologian of our time, Woody Allen, described something like this when he spoke, we are at a crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness and the other to total extinction. I pray we have the wisdom to choose wisely. Like the monkeys of India, the disciples 
are caught. They have reached through the coconut for the food of self-preservation, hoping that it would get them further than it got Jesus. But they can't get what they want. Whatever this food of self-preservation is, their mind, is in their minds, they are holding on to it with a death grip. They are stuck. There's something inside of them that does not want to hold on, but they can't let go. Like someone, and this would describe me early on when my, in my boating career, which lasted maybe one summer, um, like someone who has one foot in the boat and another on the shore not sure which way to turn. But they are pretty certain, as I was, that time is quickly running out. They are a sad group of believers, disciples. Well, maybe not so much believers anymore. I mean, what happened to their faith? Here they are, huddled behind locked doors, for fear of the Jews? Or was it for fear of Jesus? For some of them have heard that others in their group have seen what they think is the ghost of Jesus who is out and about. Either way, the room is filled with the instinctive smell of fear. And into this shame-filled place, Jesus comes. They're hiding, but Jesus finds them. Not even locked doors can keep him out. With this Jesus, you can run, but you can't hide. Maybe. Maybe sometime after this evening, in the days ahead, they can all laugh with Jesus about this, but not now. They are even more afraid. And when they hear Jesus' voice, I don't doubt they were thinking what he might say to them. These monkeys with their hands in the coconut. Jesus saying, you know, I hope Pilate and Caiaphas find you too, and you get what you deserve. Or, you know, you all should have joined Judas on the hanging tree, or you are all history. I'm back, and I'm cleaning house. But you know, that's not what he says. No, instead he speaks to them a word of peace. Peace, peace be with you. A peace which the world cannot fathom, that passes, as we say, all comprehension. It's a peace that cannot be known by grasping onto that which we think will save us, make us happy, make us whole, maybe even give us life. No, this is a different kind of peace. This is the peace of holy love that has shown itself in the ultimate act of letting go. The peace that will allow them to pull free from their coconuts. The peace that empowers all disciples of Jesus in all ages, us too, to let go. It is in the presence of this risen Jesus that we learn that what seems 
to be the final act of letting go is not the final act at all. That indeed, after this letting go, there is life, and it is life abundantly. And it is not in some far off, cloudy future, but right here, right now. Jesus has overcome the world. God's love has triumphed. And right before their eyes, they see the crucified and dead is alive. You see, in the gospel, the worst thing that can happen is always the next to the last thing, not the last thing. So Jesus says, let go, you little ones. Let go, you who are my beloved. Let go of that which binds you. What is it that you and I are holding on to for dear life that binds us? In these economic times, is it just, is it enough money to make sure that we make it through? Is it some belief that somehow, you know, we're going to, we, if we only get something that we want or desire that will be, that life will be great? What do we hold on to? that is the great illusion in our lives. It is our hand in the coconut. In these next couple of weeks, as we continue our journey together in this resurrection time of Jesus, I want to explore with you some of the possibilities of what this letting go might mean. But it means we have to face our fears. We have to make, face those things which perhaps from even our smallest time in life as a child, we started to construct as those things that we thought would make us happy. Because in this resurrection story, all that we thought is changed. Everything that we believed or held certain, like Thomas held certain that Jesus was dead, and when you're dead, you are dead, are blown apart by resurrection. So I invite you to join me on this journey together as you and I look at those things which bind us so that we might open our hand to set ourselves free. Now today I'm going to invite you particularly to practice that in our worship together. Linda and I over the years have learn to say the Lord's Prayer in what is known as the Oran's position, O-R-A-N-S, which is just a Latin word for mean, meaning praying. And it is a position of just opening your hands to receive, to let go, to be open to. And today on, on the Sundays that follow, I will invite you to simply do that. It's amazing what can happen when we take a physical act and repeat it and what life it might bring us and what step it might take us. Nothing is the same. 
and what you thought before does not hold today. That which you and I have thought would sustain us has been shown to be a false god, a distraction, a lie. This is about a new beginning, a new consciousness, a new understanding, a new life. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah.